Look at this graph! This past year, I self-studied for the AP Statistics exam and scored a 1, plus 4. I'm making this video as advice for anyone taking the exam in the future, and I will go over pretty much all of the major concepts you should understand, uh, as well as a lot of the tricks that the College Board will try to use against you. Let's talk a bit about how you should self-study, or study, for this exam. Uh, do not go straight into a test book without knowing all the material. Uh, know these concepts inside and out first. I'm going to go briefly over all the major topics just to cover the main ideas. Graphs. This means understand how to interpret bar graphs, stem and leaf graphs, histograms, pie charts, two-way tables. Know continuous versus categorical data. In other words, qualitative versus quantitative. Understand standard deviation versus variance as measures of spread. Variance is the square of standard deviation. Additionally, variances add. They always have this. I remember it because it looks a lot like the Pythagorean theorem. There's apparently some cool linear algebra explanation behind that, but uh, and if you could teach me in the comments, I'd be glad to know, but I'm not going to go over it in this uh, video. Uh, also, means are more affected by outliers than medians are. That also comes up a lot. I think the biggest takeaway from this unit is really understanding what a normal curve is. It's a bell-shaped density curve that is symmetric, unimodal, meaning it has one mode, and it follows something called the empirical rule. 68% of the data lies between plus or minus one standard deviation, 95% of the data in plus or minus two standard deviations, and 99.7% of the data in three standard deviations. A z-score is how many standard deviations away you are from the mean. All you need to construct a normal curve is a mean and a standard deviation, and you'll see that on your calculator with the normal CDF and the inverse norm functions. Z distributions are normal distributions, purely. T distributions are used for approximating Z when the population standard deviation is unknown, which it pretty much always is. As such, Z is for proportions and T is for means and slopes. T also takes in something called degrees of freedom, shorthand DF. Don't ask me what it is because it's a pretty complicated concept. Just know that the df for t distributions is n minus one, where n is the number uh, in the sample. Oh, and by the way, a statistic is a measure of a sample. A parameter is a measure of a population. I remember that because the ones with s start with s and the ones with p start with p and they're related to each other. Uh, oh, and a sampling distribution is the distribution of a statistic, like a mean or a proportion with repeated sampling. The central limit theorem, very important, tells us that the sampling distribution of sample means for pretty much any distribution with a sample size greater than 30 will be approximately normal, which is pretty awesome and super important. This seems like a lot of information, but it will become second nature with enough studying. The next unit is probability. This is the easiest unit for some, but it could also be one of the most challenging if you don't nail down the basic ideas. Understand the difference between a binomial distribution and a geometric distribution. Binomial would be the chances of me flipping three out of five heads when flipping coins. It's about combinations, so you have that choose function in the front. Geometric would be the chances of getting a head on my, on my third coin flip. It's about getting your first success. So there's no choose function attached to it. There's no combinations. Also no conditional probability. The probability of A given B is the probability of A and B over the probability of B. If you draw out the Venn diagrams, it makes a lot of sense. Just think about it a little. Disjoint, also known as mutually exclusive events, means that both cannot be true simultaneously. This is very different from independent events, meaning that one being true does not affect the other. In other words, the probability of A given B equals the probability of A normally. Next, designing studies. This was my worst unit. I hated it, and I can't even tell you why. Correlation is not causation. They always have a question about this. An experiment controls for confounding variables. So if it's well-designed and not suffering from bias, like convenient sampling, non-response bias, or biased questions, which I will not go over, then yes, you may be able to draw causal relationships. Otherwise, if you are working with an observational study, observational study, that's an important word, like a pull, then it's just an association or correlation, not causation. Correlation, by, way, by the way, is just a linear association between two variables. Association is the broader term. Also no control groups. Uh, experimental units, factors, treatments, and the difference between stratified and blocked uh, randomized designs. Double blinds aren't great, but not always possible. Placebos are used in controls. Matched pairs are great for eliminating confounding variables. Confounding variables suck. I recommend you do more research. Confidence intervals and hypothesis testing. 
this is the most complicated unit, so I'm gonna slow down for a few seconds just to make things hit home. These two ideas, confidence intervals and hypothesis testing, are under the umbrella of inferential statistics. They allow you to make inferences and draw conclusions based on data. Confidence intervals give you a range of values in a certain distribution as an estimate for a mean. Uh, the confidence level of a confidence interval, for example, a 90% confidence level, tells you your chances of your range catching the true mean with repeated sampling. The AP will always have a problem that will try to trip you up on this definition, so definitely have this down. How do you get a confidence level? Well, it's the statistic plus or minus some desired level of confidence times the standard error. And you could do this for both means and um, proportions. The whole idea behind hypothesis testing, meanwhile, is that you're going to have a certain probability distribution for your null hypothesis. The idea that is assumed, the idea that you're kind of rooting against to prove your alternative hypothesis. So you have this null distribution. Then you take a statistic from a sample and measure it against that null distribution, and you calculate the probability of getting this statistic or a statistic more extreme given this null distribution. That probability is known as your p-value, and if it's low enough, then you can draw a new conclusion and reject your null hypothesis to, in order to get your alternative hypothesis. I'm not going to go through the whole process of creating the necessary statistics uh, because those are on your uh, answer, your uh, equation sheet, but do remember these things. Frame your problems as state, plan, do, conclude. State your hypothesis and confidence level. Plan by checking all the necessary conditions, normal, random, and independent. You have to memorize all of those. Do the work, or at least write down what your calculator did, because you, you're allowed to do that. And conclude by rejecting or failing to reject, based on how much proof you have. Don't say you accept either one. Hypothesis testing is proof by contradiction, so you're not allowed to do that. That's a mistake a lot of people make. Type one error, denoted by alpha, is your confidence level. In other words, it's your chances of rejecting a true null hypothesis. It's a false positive, in other words. Type 2 error, denoted by beta, is your chances of failing to reject a null hypothesis. A false negative, in other words. I remember it by thinking that type 2 has two negatives, rejecting a false null, a false negative. If that doesn't work for you, find some other way to remember, because uh, they always ask about that as well. Additionally, 1 minus beta is your, the power of your test your chances of doing what you want to do, rejecting a false null. Increase power by increasing sample size or lowering alpha. Chi-square tests. These tests are for categorical data. The general formula is this, the sum of the actual minus expected squared over the expected value. Degrees of freedom for all chi-square tests is r minus one times c minus one. Expected value for each row must be five. There are three different types of tests. Goodness of fit is for one row of data and its corresponding expected values. Independence is testing to see if there is some correlation between variables in a given sample. For example, the association between height and weight in a given sample of men. Homogeneity is testing to see if there is an association between um, two different samples from two different populations. For example, uh, seeing the homogeneity of eye color between two genders. And, and the last one is linear regression, not linear aggression. Linear regression is the practice of taking a scatter plot and making a line of best fit for the data. The best way to do this is a least squares regression, where you minimize the sum of squared errors at each point from this given line. Uh, you need to be able to read and interpret the classic table of uh, information given to you from a least squares regression. First row is the parts of the linear equation. Uh, first is uh, the intercept, second is the slope. Second row is the standard error of that value. Third is the t-statistic. You never really need s or r squared adjusted, but s is the average residual, if that ever helps. Know the difference between r and r squared. r is the correlation coefficient within a range of negative one to one. Zero means no linear relationship, one means it fits the data with a positive correlation, and negative one with a negative correlation. It's kind of like the slope, but not really. r squared is the coefficient of determination. It's an even better indicator for how well your data fits given uh, the regression line, because it tells you what percent of the variation in Y is explained by the variation in X. It's very useful. Okay, that's my overview of the course concepts, but that alone is not enough. How can you learn about these topics in the necessary depth? My motto whenever tackling subjects of my own is diversification of sources. 
see videos, read materials, and most importantly, do lots of different types of practice problems. Here's my personal list of sources. Uh, Crash Course and Khan Academy statistics videos, which proved very helpful. But for videos, do not feel the need to watch them all in order. Look up the ones that you think you need to watch and don't be afraid to use two times speed. The general trend I saw was that Crash Course videos were very good at giving you overview introductory information behind certain statistics, but Khan Academy videos had more precise missions and helped with actually tackling specific problems. Uh, the second, mo probably most important, is uh, test books, uh, like Princeton Review, Barron's, and my personal favorite was Strive for a Five, which is really the one I used, so it's not it's my favorite, I don't know, statistics. Um, uh, again, I never read either book completely, back to back, because that would be a waste of time. You'd go over a lot of material you don't need to know. Um, but I did the test when I was ready, and I recorded every topic that I needed to study more, every question that I got wrong, I circled. Uh, college board released FRQs are very important for the two weeks leading up to the AP, because um, they help you gather all the necessary ideas about what kind of tricks the AP is going to use, um, and it gives you a lot more experience, and it makes you much better and much more prepared. Uh, your calculator. This is a crucial tool that you use for the entire test. Since I'm sort of running out of time, I compiled a list of functions you need to be able to use. Here it is. And of course, teachers and students in this course at your school. They can help a lot. Don't be afraid to ask them questions if you're confused about something. They probably know better than you. Once you know the mechanics and the mindset behind statistics, the multiple choice will go extremely smoothly. As for the free response, you have 90 minutes for six questions. Do the problems the way the college board wants. State, plan, do, conclude, if necessary. For our probability questions, make sure every variable you use is extremely clear. Explain thoroughly, but don't overdo it. And hey, the curve is pretty generous. 70% correct is still a five, so don't kill yourself trying to be completely accurate. It all comes with practice. I hope I gave you some useful tips. I told you the kind of things I wished I knew right off the bat. I have faith in you, young statistician, with a 95% confidence level, of course. Thank you and good luck.